Uh, I suppose that most of you know about the UK data service, but if uh, by any chance uh, there's someone who doesn't know, I will just briefly uh, remind you that uh, the UK data service uh, is the largest repository of social survey uh, in the UK. Uh, it does not only do social survey, but also uh, some qualitative data. Um, we are uh, hosting major government surveys as well as studies deposited by uh, academic uh, research teams. Um, we are being used, our resources are being used by uh, government as, and private sector research, uh, researcher in academia or uh, elsewhere. Uh, we are basically made of two wings. There's uh, the data curation and an administration wing uh, that's based at the University of uh, Essex. And there's the training and user support wing that's based at the University of Manchester. And I apologize for not having a northern accent. Uh, <laughs> So uh, now maybe uh, moving to uh, the program uh, for the day. Um, in the morning, uh, we are going to have uh, the traditional presentation by uh, the data producers. I'm going to uh, come to this uh, shortly. Then we'll have a coffee break and we'll have uh, the presentation by our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Melanie Jones from uh, Cardiff. Uh, business school. We'll then have our lunch and uh, we will uh, have the two paper sessions uh, in, uh, in the afternoon. One revolving more about disparities and inequalities and the other one about uh, skills matching uh, on the uh, labor market. So if there aren't any uh, questions at this stage, I'm uh, immediately going to move to uh, the first uh, session of the day. And uh, so it is my, my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, the first uh, group of speakers. Uh, to start with, uh, we have uh, Martina Helm uh, from uh, the Office for National Statistics. So Martina, for those uh, who don't know her yet, is the head of the Labour Force Survey uh, Research Team at the ONS. Uh, so she's basically responsible for input management, macro data production, and uh, dissemination. Uh, so Martina is going to give us an update on uh, the LFS and uh, the APS. It will then be followed by uh, James, uh, James Harris, who's the lead uh, on uh, the Labour Force Survey team and who's uh, one of the driving force behind the Transform Labour Force Survey uh, and he's going to tell us uh, all about it in his presentation. And then uh, maybe, if, uh, and that's the first, we are going to have, uh, uh, but as a, as a separate presentation, we also have a presentation uh, by Shivun Troy Smith uh, who uh, from the uh, Office for Statistics Regulation, who is also uh, going to talk to us uh, about uh, regulating uh, labour market statistics. So, uh, without further ado, I will uh, give the floor to Martina. So, I'm just going to switch to the slide. Hello and welcome everyone. So, um, thank you for the introduction. Um, good to uh, be at a face-to-face -face event again. Um, it's been a few years, I think, since we had one. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm here today to talk to you about the uh, data collection uh, and production about the, uh, for the LFS and uh, APS. Sorry, can everyone hear me from here? Or yeah. And I think I'll specifically focus uh, on the events of the last sort of six to 12 months, as I'm sure you're aware that we've been facing um, some challenges. Um, and uh, I'm sure you're keen to see what the sort of the latest developments are. In this space, there should be time at the end of my presentation to uh, take some questions. And um, I've also got, apart from uh, James, uh, who uh, Pierre already introduced, a few colleagues from the ONS who come here today as well, who will introduce at the end, who then may, will, may be able to help with some of the questions as well. Um, so moving on to the uh, data collection update. So a bit of a recap in terms of the journey we've come through so far, this graph here shows the a number of achieved household 
interviews for our main wave one sample between January 2019 to uh, June 2023. And um, so here you can see quite clearly what happened when we hit the pandemic. Um, obviously our sample went down in around uh, March 22, 2020. And um, obviously we changed mode from face-to-face uh, -to, -face to telephone and with a number of other adaptation to our data collection, um, including uh, increasing our issued sample, which we doubled at the time, we then managed to uh, increase our achieved sample again. We introduced knock to nudge, um, so basically uh, once um, lockdown measures eased, our interns were able to go out again, nudging households to participate. Um, and we were then tweaking our issued sample further to sort of uh, balance um, our capacity in the field. And you can see sort of the sort of ups and downs that we felt as another Deep in 2022, where Omicron wave hit, and what we basically tried to sort of manage our achieved sample around that level. Um, there were, however, a number of challenges that we've been facing since the pandemic that made the uh, the maintenance at uh, the pre-pandemic levels uh, more difficult. Um, so during uh, the pandemic and since then, uh, interview roles were obviously changing. So we changed from face to face to telephone. Then we introduced not to nudge. Um, we had different field strategies for our different um, data collection uh, projects uh, in social service at the UNS, which made it logistically obviously challenging for our interviewers. We had a lot of staff turnover during and since the pandemic. Uh, meaning that um, there were different expectations of new and existing interviewers in terms of a flexible and hybrid working. Um, the recruitment of interviewers is also a challenge um, that was felt um, across um, data collection agencies, not an ONS specific um, issue, so an, uh, some, but something that was felt uh, across the board. Um, and something that we are still sort of working on, trying to bring uh, new interviews in to, to ease the capacity pressures. Um, and with the LFS being run in parallel um, to the transformed labour force survey, um, as obviously competing priorities that we are trying to manage here. And then with mid-2023, so last year, um, we were meant to uh, transition to the transformed labour force survey uh, around June, July, but a decision was made that we extend the dual run. Uh, so obviously these challenges had to be mitigated for longer. Um, and then unfortunately the level of achieved interviews um, in July to September, uh, so another sharp decrease at that point, um, which took it below the level that we saw at the onset of the pandemic, and this led to an overall sample size now. Um, in our data set that was too low to produce estimates of sufficient enough quality and that meant that we had to pause the release of our outputs at that point. Um, and the, the issue came more acute uh, for, the, for the August sample uh, which meant that the, um, the LFS estimates that were due to be published in October last year as well as the microdata that we were meant to release in November last year were suspended because of uh, quality concerns. And beginning of November, we then uh, published an article outlining sort of a full set of recovery measures. So it's quite small on the slides, but they will be circulated. So you can uh, read up on that um, afterwards, but I'll, I'll go through them to explain a bit more. Um, so the, these, this recovery action plan uh, involves sort of three elements two of them focusing on the current LFS, so the here and now, and the third one on the transformed labour force survey. I'm not going to go really into detail about the transformed labour force survey because James is going to cover that in his session after mine. Um, but just to say a little bit more about the recovery measures we put in place for the LFS. <coughs> uh, so on the data collection size, uh, uh, side, we introduced or we reintroduced the promotion of home interviewing or face-to-face -face interviewing uh, from sort of mid-end of October. Um, we started reissuing unproductive cases um, to different interviewers to see whether that could potentially help with increasing response. Um, we directed more experienced field staff to the LFS 
um, and we're backfilling then with um, agency workers on, on less critical survey work. Uh, we increased um, our field hours to include also Sunday working. Um, same for our telephone operations, we increased hours. Um, and also we tried to focus on um, uh, younger households of which we were seeing less in the sample. We started um, a project looking at more targeted communications to raise the profile of the ONS brand to increase participation. That's something, uh, a project that's still ongoing, uh, we're working on. Um, and uh, we increased our respondents' incentive. So uh, up until then, we had a £10 unconditional incentive offered uh, at Wave 1. And we increased that at that point to offer a £25 uh, unconditional incentive plus a 25 conditional incentive on completion. So in total, a household, a wave one household would get 50 pounds. Uh, and for wave two to five, uh, respondents uh, received just the 25 pound conditional incentive. So also something we introduced for the follow-up waves. Um, and we also put measures in place to then boost our sample again from January to March. Um, this year. Uh, this is something that needs a longer lead time, so we couldn't do that straight away from October. Uh, but um, we were planning to do that from January onwards. Uh, and then with regards to methodological interventions, I'm going to go into that a little bit later in more detail. But we basically looked here as to how we could update our weighting framework in line with the TLFS, uh, removing some of the adjustments, the interim adjustments that we've made in the previous rebating exercise improving the non-response adjustment as well, looking at model-based approaches and that kind of thing. Um, and so this was the action plan that we implemented as of, of for the October to December quarter. And we continued that into the January to March quarter, pretty much in the same way, apart from one change, that was that we dropped the reissuing of unproductive cases. Um, which meant that the casework just stayed with the same interviewers for the whole two weeks uh, of the field period, um, as it, it, it felt like that was more practical than the reissuing. So the, the casework was still worked by interviewers, uh, just remained with the same person. Uh, but apart from that, everything remained the same, and as of January, basically, we had the increased uh, wave on sample. So what happened to our response rates at that point? Again, so you've got here the time series starting from January 2019, just to see where we were at that point. Um, dropping then obviously at the onset of the pandemic. Um, so we had like mid 50s response rate beforehand and then we were in the um, high 20s to mid 30s thereafter. And you can see here at the very right, um, in green, this is the period where the recovery measures um, were implemented. So in um, October to November, we saw uh, an increase. So there's a bit of a peak there um, to um, 33, 38% uh, in October, November, which is down to the recovery measures that we've implemented. There is a dip, however, in December, uh, which is not unexpected. This is um, it's a seasonal effect we see in our response rates are not unusual. We can see, I don't think the point is working. Um, there is a similar dip um, in December here, here, and up here. Um, so this is, it was not unexpected. And with January to February, uh, sorry, January to March, our response rates went up again, not to the same level as we saw it back in October to November. No, However, pointer. that pointer. was pointer. this one. Oh, no, the one underneath, pointer. Oh, yeah. No. no. <laughs> I might try to do it with that. It's okay. fine. Sorry. Thank you. That's <laughs> no, fine. Um, so the response rates in, in uh, January, February were going up again. But you might ask, why didn't they go up all the way back to October, November level? That's because we've got now the bigger sample. So we had to, it was the same sort of capacity we've got in the field now working on a bigger sample. So that's why our response rate weren't quite the same. Slight dip then again in March. Again, not unexpected because um, we had the, the Easter bank holidays and it's also the end of leave year. So there's more leave being taken um, for field interviews. Um, however, with April, our response rates is not on the chart here, but they were back up to 
0.4%, uh, so around the same level again as we saw them in January, February. But what does that mean now in terms of our achieved sample? So this is, I guess, where the good news is starting. <laughs> um, so here you can see sort of the continued timeline from what I showed you earlier, with the red period was the uh, recent sharp decline, and then with October to December you can see now a slight increase again, um, where we had uh, just over 5,000 achieved households for that quarter in wave one, and uh, with increasing our wave one sample in January to March, uh, we achieved 7,500 uh, household interviews in that quarter. Uh, and we would expect that uh, to maintain that now at that level, if not improve, as we are continuing our, our measures um, going forward. Uh, on the next slide is a, is a bar chart that shows the um, achieved uh, household interviews on a weekly basis, including all five waves. So the previous one was just wave one only, and this is now all five waves together. And uh, you can see here in the uh, black frame, this is the period October to December. And um, the number of achieved household interviews is increasing sort of from end of October uh, to November, where the implemented recovery measures are starting to take effect. And um, in December, the dip, which I mentioned, the seasonal effect that we see pretty much every year, um, so that was not unusual. Um, the increase in October to November was mainly driven by, by uh, prioritising uh, wave two to five small at that point, um, whereas the increase in January to March was mainly driven by the boosted sample, the boosted wave one sample, uh, which we managed to largely maintain at that point, apart from end of March where we had the Easter bank holidays. And it's continuing uh, at that level in April, although I haven't got that under chart uh, at the moment. Uh, but what does this mean for you as users of the LFS and APS person data set? So try to show that with this graph a bit more because that's probably more relevant to you. Uh, so this chart shows the size or the number of individual cases on an uh, LFS quarterly person data set. So you've got here the period from uh, GM uh, 19, so pre-pandemic, we had just under 90,000 cases on a file. You can see the dip that we had in the pandemic down to just under 70,000. And then um, you can see the effect of us implementing measures, tweaking the sample size, etc. So it went up and then down again, where we tried to work on all the challenges that we've been facing, which I mentioned earlier. And uh, you can see here where it's sort of level. This is in October 2023. So with the measures that we've implemented um, in October, we managed to uh, bring this decrease to a stop. And by continuing the measures implemented, uh, by continuing the measures into January to March, we managed to now uh, reverse that trend and the data set size is going up again. So for JM24, we've got now uh, 50,700 or 50,800 cases. Um, and uh, based on the assumption that uh, we're continuing with those measures, we should see an upwards trend now because obviously the increase will feed through in the next waves with all cohorts then um, being bigger going forward. So in the April to uh, June quarter, we should have around 56, uh, 57,000 uh, cases on the data set. The last two quarters I just put there, this is more hypothetical because obviously we are um, uh, awaiting a decision on the transition from the current LFS to the transformed LFS. Um, so this is just hypothetical. If we were to continue the, the LFS, we would expect it to increase further to around about those levels. Um, and for APS users, I thought I'll bring this, this up as well. So this is the um, size of an uh, APS person data set. The changes here are um, slower and so it's, it's a bit of a shallower um, uh, a trend here because the data set is constructed in a different way. It includes uh, the quarterly main sample for wave 1s and wave 5s as well as the annual boost samples. 
Um, and um, so the, chain, the implementation of those recovery measures take a while to feed through, really. But we can see that with the implementation of the recovery measures, it's again leveling now, and you can see sort of the slow increase if we continue to run uh, the APS into, into those quarters. Um, so what to expect going forward? Uh, data collection for April to June quarters obviously in progress uh, with those recovery measures still in place. Um, we're continuing to recruit uh, interview uh, interviewers to improve our field capacity. And uh, so we're waiting a decision on a decision of the decommissioning of the LFS uh, and transition to the transformed LFS in the coming weeks. Um, but until we have that decision, we continue to prepare for the next quarter, for the July to September quarter, obviously as if we were continuing it. So we've already drawn the sample, we put everything in place uh, just in case, and we'd only stop that once the decision's been made. Just not to risk any outputs, basically. So moving on uh, to the uh, waiting. Um, just sort of to quickly summarize, up until 2020, um, we reweighted our data sets every two years using the latest population projections. Um, with the mode change then obviously in 2020, um, from face-to-face uh, -to, -face to telephone interviewing in wave one, there was sort of a bias introduced in the data, which, meaning, which meant that we had more owner occupiers rather than uh, renters um, participating, and also the split between UK-born and non-UK-born population um, uh, wasn't quite as it should be. So since then, we um, uh, um, introduced a 10-year adjustment to the calibration um, in 2020, and we also uh, ran a reweighting exercise in 2021-22, um, which introduced um, an RTI-based, uh, so um, tax-based um, uh, growth rates, um, which obviously had limitations as well. But this was um, sort of the best uh, possible. Uh, sticky plaster we could put on in, uh, in the absence of um, the population estimates at the time. Um, so the current weighting system on the, on the LFS uh, APS relies on uh, age, sex, ge geographical information, uh, country of birth, uh, rate uh, growth adjustment and the tenure distribution uh, adjustment. And uh, the population totals um, they were based on the 2018-based population projections, which then were further adjustment, adjusted with the employee, employment growth rates from the HMRC tax data. And since this tax data is not available in a timely fashion, um, it made uh, sort of the, the re-weighting uh, more challenging. So as part of the... Um, Re um, recovery measures that we've implemented. We've um, introduced a further reweighting exercise um, where we covered the LFS back series for uh, 14 ruling quarters from uh, uh, July to September 2022 to September to November 2023, and obviously all ongoing um, uh, uh, quarters thereafter were on the same basis. Um, and that was based on age, sex, geographical information, and the tenure distribution, which is based on the 2021 census. And this reweighting exercise was based on um, now the mid-2021 uh, population estimates for England and Wales, which were released early 2023. Um, at that point, we also then uh, dropped the RTI constraint. Um, and uh, with this method, we managed to more closely align our outputs with the transformed labour force survey to really help the comparison between the two sources and also the discontinue work, discontinu discontinuity work <laughs> um, that's ongoing. Um, and the reweighted LFS data sets uh, were released. Yes, I'm almost at the end. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the reweighted LFS uh, data sets were released. Um, in February this year, um, and we are at the moment now debating uh, several options in terms of a further re interim reweighting exercise by uh, potentially extending the back series for the LFS uh, until further back than 2022, 
and or taking on a, a more recent population estimates because we had new national population projections released beginning of this year um, and or extending to additional LFS and APS outputs. Uh, and obviously as soon as a decision is made on that matter then we communicate that um, to the whole user base. And um, yeah, that actually brings me to the end of my presentation.